introduce my name is Andre. I work for Trinimbus as a solutions architect. And uh, to begin with, and I can hear the talk about the serverless applications in AWS, but kind of to begin with, let me start by saying that uh, Trinimbus is uh, actually happens to be the largest premier uh, consulting partner for AWS in Canada. And as such, we are uh, on basically a daily basis, I deal with a number of customers of different sizes, different backgrounds that are in AWS or moving to AWS. And a uh, year ago or so, uh, up until about a year ago or so, our typical customer would come to us and would ask about you know, how to deploy their servers into AWS. Uh, most typical IT stuff, load balancers, auto-scaling groups, servers, failovers, backups, uh, horizontal scaling, and, and pretty much every customer you know, had a variant of, uh, <coughs> of this type of a request. And it was about a year ago that something has changed. That suddenly we started having customers that would come and say, well, how do we get rid of our servers? Uh, and I don't mean getting rid of the physical servers, that, that's obvious, that's what we are doing before, but how do we get rid of our virtualized servers? Like we heard that there is this new uh, AWS Lambda thing, and does it work for us? What can it do for us? Uh, what else could we do? And so uh, during this presentation this afternoon, I would like to share kind of our experience with, uh, with, with this transition, with this transition from uh, server-based applications to serverless applications and to what extent it's really feasible, to what extent it's uh, you know, just a marketing myth, and to what extent it's really working, and maybe elaborate on uh, some of the points that Ted made earlier in his presentation about the AWS Lambda service. Uh, so uh, to begin with, I'll start, uh, I call it here, definition of serverless, but it's, uh, it's not exactly definition. Basically, I'll be pondering about various <clears throat> what would different people consider serverless because it's a very overloaded term. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some advantages and disadvantages of trying to move to the serverless. Uh, I'll talk about the implications of uh, moving to serverless, as, uh, both technical implications and non-technical implications on many organizations. And uh, after a couple of these introductory slides, I'd like to get basically to the core of my presentation that uh, we'll see whether you find overwhelming or not. But basically, I'd like to focus on uh, essentially a laundry list of AWS uh, services that do have the serverless character and how you can assemble them to build more complex applications. We will talk about some smaller patterns that you can use and then how these patterns kind of result into a larger application. Uh, and yeah, that will be kind of the core of my presentation. That's where I'll focus most of my time. So what is serverless? Um, well, one way of looking at it is, even though it's a relatively recent buzzword, but one way of looking at it, that it's a very kind of natural evolution that started maybe 10 years ago when Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Services uh, basically popularized the notion of infrastructure as a service. You know, shortly after that, especially community working on mobile applications came with the concept of BAS or backend as a service, uh, where bas basically they were after a model where you write a piece of code and you just have some sort of a backend platform that's handling it for you. So you have your mobile applications and backend code, and you don't really worry about how that backend code is deployed. Uh, but very quickly, people realized, of course, it's not only mobile, it's it's more general than mobile, so we started talking about PaaS, platform as a service, and I said the most recent buzzword, most recent moniker that's attached to this uh, is serverless. Uh, and so when I say serverless, uh, like different people think of different things. Uh, on one extreme, for some people, uh, they will say, yes, it's serverless as long as I have managed hardware, an operating system, and maybe my <coughs> <clears throat> Maybe my middleware software, like my Apache Tomcat, somebody will take care of that. And, and somebody at that moment will say, okay, that's already serverless, don't have to worry about my servers. But then there is kind of the, the opposite extreme, and that's kind of example, the Lambda, AWS Lambda service that uh, 
uh, that was talking about where where actually much more much more functional it is uh, managed for me. It is uh, high availability of my code. It is automatic failover of my code, and uh, in particular scalability, uh, horizontal scalability of my application, basically growing. Uh, Growing the resources that are needed to run my application based on the actual load. Uh, and here, when you start digging into it, you will realize there is kind of a fine line between what the horizontal scale, how the horizontal scalability can be achieved. And we will see it on a, a very specific examples of AWS services that sometimes the, the horizontal scalability is there, but is, is configurable. It's, uh, it, it, it's somewhat explicit there. Yeah, like somehow you have to say how much throughput you want your application to handle, and then the, 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 the platform provider will deal with it for you. Uh, but in, but the, the holy grail would be that no, you don't have to specify anything. The, the platform will figure out how much load it needs to handle, and you'll figure out how many instances of, uh, of virtual machines or containers it needs to launch. So there is a, there's a different services kind of on this level, whether they are configurable or auto scaling, they fall in different categories and different people will be arguing what is serverless and what is not serverless. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we'll be covering kind of all of the options and, and we'll just explicitly mention that, well, this is more serverless and this is less serverless on, on this uh, sliding scale. Uh, so now kind of with this understanding, uh, why would you want to do serverless as opposed to why you wouldn't want to? Well, I think the main, uh, the main thing that people like about it, basically you get out of the box scalability and availability for your code. It's literally the idea is, as, uh, as we saw with the AWS Lambda, the idea is that you write a piece of code and you don't worry about anything else somebody else takes care of running and scaling the code. Uh, so that's kind of the ultimate thing that people are after. Uh, now, there are kind of implications of this one. We are writing a, a bit because we can focus on the application code. There is less infrastructure code, and especially uh, less uh, code related to provisioning your infrastructure to building up your environments and throwing them down and how to scale them. So kind of the whole this idea is kind of relatively agile friendly and DevOps friendly. Uh, basically kind of there is less operation stuff to do. And uh, so this is kind of a very nice uh, value proposition for especially small startups for very agile teams that really focus on developing and iterating software rather than maintaining uh, and operating large infrastructure. So that's a, that's a very interesting proposition. Uh, last but not least, one of the advantages, <coughs> although here one can argue either way, is security. Uh, I guess the idea being that uh, uh, lots of the security issues in today's applications are coming from you know, holes in the underlying OS, uh, kind of lower down on the stack, and, and here you have somebody else taking care of it, so hopefully they'll do their job. and. Uh, and you really have to focus on the security of, of your application layer. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are also significant disadvantages, I would say, to, to going serverless, and in particular today. When I say in particular today, serverless is very much the bleeding edge of technology. Uh, we will be talking about some tools that are available uh, most of them are in beta or barely outside of beta. So you will be, if you start using them, you will be finding missing functionality, bugs. I mean, you will be a beta user. Uh, AWS Lambda itself has been in uh, GA for about a year. I think it was last spring when it went GA. So yeah, it's not a beta product, but it is relatively, one can argue, immature product. And there is lots of functionality that one would wish uh, that was there and that is coming. So definitely in the serverless world, if you start today, you will be struggling or you will be dealing with these issues. Uh, there is a learning curve associated with this. Uh, as we will see through some, uh, on some diagrams later on, 
designing serverless architectures requires a significant mind shift for the, for the architects. Um, and so there's lots of things to learn that sort of kind of can slow down and go a little bit against that agility because you will have a long, long startup. Uh, talk about the mental shift, uh, less flexibility. Uh, many people that we talk to find that, well, these uh, so-called serverless services that are supposed to simplify my life as a software developer or architect are actually imposing constraints because they do not support features that I would like. The time, you know, an example of queuing service here, yeah, you may be used to Apache and queue, very kind of stable product, uh, very feature-rich. Then you say, okay, let's switch to a serverless version of it, Amazon SQS, and suddenly go, uh, where are all the features that I want? They are very basic, so uh, you need to kind of build your applications around it. That's, I guess, related to the bleeding edge of technology, but yes, this is a, this is a new field. And finally, uh, some architectures and uh, kind of some legacy applications may be hard to migrate to the serverless world because uh, because just their design is uh, just kind of doesn't fit with the current implementation of the serverless platforms. I'll talk about it a little bit more later on. Well, once you decide that in spite of these pros and cons that you do want to go serverless because you believe it is the future and, and it, it will help you. Uh, there are a number of impacts to consider. I already talked, touched a little bit on the architecture, that there is a whole new ecosystem of tools that you have to learn, that you have to master because before you can successfully implement serverless solutions. Uh, but kind of assuming that learning how assuming that's over. Otherwise, uh, in terms of the architecture, it's actually not that bad. And, and you will find that serverless is just putting renewed emphasis on the kind of stateless microservices approach, uh, stateless microservices with a uh, data store kind of backing them. So there is, aside from the new tools, there is not that much in the architecture. Uh, however, where there are significant complications or significant implications are for CMN operations. Uh, as far as configuration management is concerned, I'm sure the, those of you who are who kind of touch DevOps uh, are familiar with tools such as Chef, Bucket, Salt, Ansible, uh, that are used for configuration management today. And when you go serverless, you realize that all of these tools, well, they don't really work, or they don't really work that well, because after all, these tools are designed to maintain state of a server or perhaps of a container. And here we are saying, no, that all goes away. So, so suddenly the, the, the traditional tools don't really work that well here. It's not to say there is not a configuration management issue once you are in serverless. It's just to say that the tools that are currently used for CMM do not necessarily fit well, well, very well with the serverless model. So, there is some work to be done there. Uh, and the major impact uh, on operations. Uh, if you are a small startup, it's all great. There is nothing really to worry about. But if you are a larger organization, and as uh, somebody mentioned here before, you have a team of 1,000 people that are running your operations and running your applications, then suddenly the skill set of these 1,000 people needs to be refreshed because they will be looking after something completely different. Uh, not to mention that, uh, in a way, you are outsourcing the work that your operations team is doing today. You are outsourcing to somebody else. So there is the HR aspect of the whole move that you know, some of the operations staff may see this as taking away their jobs. So it may be there may be some kind of serious non-technical implications of, uh, uh, of implementing serverless. But assuming that, okay, you are, you are, you are fine with this and you decide to push serverless, uh, your next task will be to decide on a serverless platform that you want to use. Uh, as you would expect, basically, all major players that are in public cloud, they do provide uh, some sort of a serverless platform. Uh, AWS, it's uh, Lambda, 
uh, service Microsoft Azure with Vengeance, Google Cloud Platform, IronLog, uh, IronIO, everybody speaking of the bleeding edge of technology, powered by Facebook, uh, just recently celebrated as kind of being much further ahead than Amazon, and, and in many ways they were. Well, Facebook announced that they are retiring that service. So you choose a platform a year later, the platform may be no more. That's uh, that risk of being on the bleeding edge of technology. Uh, anyway, you pursue, you persevere, you decide, yeah, we are going to use AWS Lambda, because that's what I'm familiar with, so that's what I'll be talking about next. So, uh, serverless in AWS. Um, interesting thing to note, and that I will be emphasizing in the subsequent slides, uh, AWS has a number of uh, what you would call traditional legacy offerings, legacy services that have been around since day one, that before anybody was talking about serverless or even pass. And, uh, but these offerings do fit very well into the serverless model and, and definitely do belong there. So we'll be talking about those. But then, uh, most importantly, they are the game changers of uh, AWS Lambda and API Gateway service in the AWS world that have been uh, we said, uh, introduced in the last year and that basically cast a very different light on these uh, legacy uh, serverless services and provide very new ways of uh, assembling them to larger applications. So without further ado, our first simplest serverless application, a static website. Uh, I'm sure you are all familiar with S3. I hope you are all familiar with S3. Uh, basically, an object store provided by Amazon is actually one of the two very first services that Amazon introduced about 10 years ago when AWS started. Um, from the serverless point of view, the interesting thing about S3 is that you can configure S3 to serve its content as a, as a web server. So if you have a static website consisting of some HTML, JavaScript, and video images, CSS, you can just put it into S3, you can expose it as a, as a web server, and suddenly, suddenly you have highly available, scalable, practically infinitely scalable website, serving static content, but not a functioning website. There is nothing really much more that needs to be done. Okay, nothing much more, maybe a little bit more. Uh, uh, let's put uh, Content Delivery Network in front of my bucket. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with uh, CDNs such as Akamai. Well, AWS has its own version. Uh, it's called CloudFront. Uh, and why I'm bringing it up? Well. The interesting thing about CloudFront is the disconnection here between the edge locations provided by CloudFront and S3 uh, goes through, uh, if not uh, private Amazon networks, but at least optimized. So if you have, uh, 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 if you are using CloudFront for right access to your S3, users uploading images, let's say, uh, to your site, to your bucket, then actually the behavior, it may be faster for the web browser to go through CloudFront to, because the edge location is relatively close and then use the optimized network connectivity to S3 rather than the web browser uploading directly to S3. It's just kind of a minor optimization to be aware of. Okay, so uh, my S3, that was, that was the static site. Yeah, that was just serving my static content. Uh, so how do I add uh, some dynamic functionality to it? Well, as you know from early in the morning, there is the AWS Lambda service that currently supports Java, Node.js, and Python. And basically, you can start writing your backend uh, in one of these three languages and uploading it to Lambda. And then, for example, uh, your web browser, it's uh, not here, can invoke the Lambda function that get something to happen and some content to generate dynamically. Uh, on the, <coughs> uh, in terms of the serverlessness, uh, this Lambda function is really the ideal 
uh, because you don't have to provision any throughput for it. It's just there for you. It will scale automatically to whatever load is desired. Uh, because Lambda is such a critical part of the, uh, of, of the whole this concept of uh, uh, serverless computing in AWS, I'd like to talk a little bit check time. Uh, a little bit about uh, uh, kind of what the Lambda implementation is under the hood. Basically, what's happening that uh, the Lambda, is, the AWS Lambda service, is essentially maintaining a fleet of EC2 machines, EC2 instances, a fleet of virtual machines, and each of those machines is running a, a number of containers. These do not appear to be Docker containers for those who are interested, but couldn't really figure out, and Amazon doesn't document it, what container technology they are using. And inside of these Docker containers, Lambda service is running its own code, plus the code that you upload. And so when you are invoking a function, essentially what is happening that the Lambda service will find a EC2 instance, suitable EC2 instance, find a container on that instance, then talk to the appropriate wrapper and ask it to execute your code and then return the results back. Now with this mental model in mind, uh, there is a couple of interesting points. Uh, first of all, content reuse. Uh, uh, of course, like, you know, building these containers, provisioning these containers, it's not free. It, it, it takes a few moments. So uh, it would be foolish if after every single Lambda invocation, Amazon would destroy that container. Uh, so they kind of keep it around for a while. They can keep it around, up and running. And so the next time uh, you make the next invocation to your Lambda, you may hit an already running an existing container. So for example, here, if your Lambda function creates a temporary file inside of its own sandbox, inside of that container, the subsequent invocation can find it. So okay, just kind of something interesting to note and, and, and be aware of. Uh, another important implication, and I think Ted, uh, Ted touched this topic about, uh, touched this topic is the issue of cold starts. Like what happens if the Lambda service cannot find a, a suitable running container? It needs to provision that container. In the worst case, it may even have to provision the EC2 instance to launch your container on. Uh, in this case, we are talking about cold starts, and there may be, in spite of what Amazon would like you to believe, uh, there may be relatively significant penalties and delays associated with its, uh, with its cold starts. Uh, and when I say significant, I mean on the level of seconds. Uh, things become even more complicated or even, even worse if your if your Lambda function is something like uh, JVM-based, uh, and your JVM, you know, it's, a, it's relatively heavy machinery, needs to load some jar files. The impacts may be significant. You may be talking about a few seconds before a cold container is available to, to start processing your requests. Once it's up and running, the, the responses are very quick. But the first hit that you get, there, there may be a penalty you're paying for it. And, uh, Another interesting kind of comment is understanding this freezing and thawing cycle. Basically what is happening when your, your Lambda function, your code, because it's running inside of a container, it can launch a completely separate process outside of, outside of Lambda, but inside of this container. And that process can be long running, and your Lambda function can return to the, and the Lambda services, okay, you are done and the Lambda service will freeze that container. It will stop allocating CPU time to it. And if you call your Lambda function next time, and if it so happens that your container is reduced, uh, your Lambda code can actually query the environment in which it is running and can realize, yeah, this process, that the previous invocation left running here, it is still here and now it resumed and it continues processing. Uh, again, something that can lead to some interesting design patterns. The, the, however, the problem here is that all of this functionality is, uh, I don't want to say unsupported, but undocumented and subject to change at any time. So use it at your own risk. Uh, uh, 
Uh, again, something that Ted mentioned uh, before, the Lambda functions by itself are, are very nice and everything, but the interface to invoke those Lambda functions is a little bit cumbersome. It is basically about AWS APIs. It's not uh, the APIs here. Uh, they are AWS specific. They, they do not reflect your application. They do not reflect your application resources. Uh, so uh, that's, where, that's where the API gateway service comes into play, where basically you, uh, you map the Lambda functions into APIs as they are as, you know, your REST APIs that your application can easily understand. Uh, though I should say the API gateway is meant to front not only Lambdas, but it can front also another HTTP service instead of a Lambda. Uh, it can front an AWS, another AWS web service, or it can have mock implementation, basically hard-coded implementation of an API directly inside of the gateway for quick prototyping. And uh, in addition to kind of wrapping Lambda or whatever other backend service, it provides functionality for right throttling throttling versioning uh, stages or environments, basically multiple versions of the Lambda that can be configured differently and, uh, and some access control functionality as well. Okay, moving on. So uh, we have our API gateway Lambda. The next thing that we would like to have is a persistent data store. Uh, in AWS, when we talk serverless AWS, the the, the ideal candidate for your data store is DynamoDB. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, DynamoDB is uh, basically a key value NoSQL database. Uh, on the, in terms of serverlessness, it's somewhere, uh, it's not as nice as Lambda in the sense that DynamoDB requires that you explicitly provision throughput independently read throughput and independently write throughput. Um, so it doesn't auto-scale, so to speak, even though there are people that uh, are kind of working around it because, because provisioning of the throughput is done by an API call. You can basically write your own auto-scaling and you can, you know, based on the time of day, if your traffic is dependent on the time of day, you can be adjusting, uh, let's say, the throughput of uh, uh, of your Dynamo database, um, or you can even monitor the load that's on your system, and you can be resharding DynamoDB. It is possible that people are doing it. Uh, there is, uh, I will not go, I have another slide here for uh, DynamoDB design patterns, but I don't think we will have time to get into it in much detail. Uh, Basically, just one very quick comment. Uh, if you are going to try Dynamo, or for that matter, any other NoSQL database, forget everything about, that you know about database design. Most of us have a background in designing relational data models. They simply do not work in the non-relational world. Uh, you will end up with a design that will be underperforming uh, that you have issues. Yeah, you have to be very careful about designing NoSQL databases. Basically, the paradigm in NoSQL is that, uh, and that is very different from the SQL world uh, or from the relational world. Uh, you absolutely need to understand your data access patterns, and you need to design your database structure or your table structure, your indexes in particular based on the data access pattern. If you do it otherwise, you are bound to be disappointed. You, you are bound to be switching back to SQL engines. Uh, from the patterns, uh, maybe there is one that I mentioned, or that's more of an anti-pattern, storing time series data in a NoSQL database, or in DynamoDB in particular. We have a number of clients that figure, OK, great, Dynamo, let's just start dumping logs into it for later processing. Uh, do not do it. Uh, if you really must do something like that, uh, be prepared for having tables, let's say, based on you know, one table per month of the year, 
and repopulating tables in this way. And then you can adjust throughput on the old tables that uh, contain your historical data. You can turn the throughput down there, and you can jack up the throughput on the most recent tables that contain your current data. Uh, because you will be, otherwise you will end up with over-provisioned tables uh, and you will be overpaying for what it's doing for you. There is a number of other patterns that uh, I'll probably be talking to tomorrow for those that will be attending the, tut <coughs> the tutorial about serverless. We'll be going through some of these patterns in more detail. Uh, but as I said, summary being when designing NoSQL databases, forget everything that you know from the relational world. Okay, so uh, we have uh, our Lambda with the gateway, with a persistent data store. The next thing we would like to use is some sort of a caching layer. Uh, in the world of AWS, the answer to the caching layer is uh, uh, AWS Elastic Cache Service. Uh, Elastic Cache Service is a kind of a family of services that are, it's basically a management layer on top of Redshift or MemcacheD, your choice. Uh, like Redis and Memcached are taken basically as the yard provided by the open source community, and just an additional management layer is put on top of that. So, uh, in terms of serverlessness, the Elastic Cache is kind of somewhere in between because uh, because it is basically managing clusters of the of the Redis or Memcached uh, software. Uh, so what it provides is kind of easy interface to change the size of your cluster to initiate failover, but it doesn't provide any magic that wouldn't be available in the underlying uh, in the underlying tools. Uh, <clears throat> going back to Dynamo, there is another interesting service that uh, a number of our customers use, and that's DynamoDB Streams. Uh, so DynamoDB streams is essentially essentially your DynamoDB transaction log. It uh, contains all the information about all the updates uh, or inserts into, into your Dynamo table. Uh, basically, two use cases that we come across. Uh, one that is on this diagram is that you use DynamoDB streams, you hook up Lambda function onto those and you feed the updates into Elastic if you are updating your cache that your applications then are accessing. Uh, the other fairly common pattern is replicating Dynamo to, let's say, another region functional that Amazon uh, typically doesn't provide. Usually, all Amazon services are uh, contained in one region, so if you want to cross the region boundary, in most cases, you have to do it yourself. So this is a way of replicating your Dynamo database to in the regions. Uh, now moving away from the example of the web application that we had, a data pipeline. This is kind of another typical scenario that we see a number of our customers implementing some sort of a data pipeline. I have a stream of data, basically usually a stream of files in this case, that are being dropped into an S3 bucket. I can look at Lambda functions to process the, the new files. Uh, I can configure a three to invoke Lambda whenever there is an update. Uh, Lambda can do some processing, generate a new file, and uh, put it, let's say, into another bucket, and you can basically change this one. Uh, once you have this type of a setup, okay, what do you do here in the end? Uh, the answer is SNS. Uh, SNS stands for Simple Notification Service, is again one of the uh, uh, one of the more traditional services provided by AWS, but it is very much it is very much a serverless service that you don't have to worry about provisioning anything about it. Uh, it's it's essentially a publish subscribe mechanism where you define a topic, somebody is publishing updates for the topic, and then you have others that are listening for those updates. Uh, the updates can be sent to. REST APIs to Lambda functions to email to text uh, number of options number of options there. Uh, so uh, so basically, when your data pipeline is done, you can post, you can hook it, you can configure S3 to update a specific topic in SNS. 
and then SMS can broadcast the change uh, <coughs> the end of your data pipeline processing to other services that may be interested in it. Now, uh, looking at this diagram, when we said when we mentioned this to our customers, the first thing they ask, well, uh, and what if my lambda fails? What is the retry logic here? Like, will I lose some processing? Like, will the pipeline break? And the answer is twofold. Uh, one answer is that uh, S3, uh, th this connection between S3 and Lambda will retry a couple of times, retry at least three times, uh, but after that you are out of luck. If your Lambda function for some reason keeps failing after that, you are out of luck, you would have to have some sort of a monitoring solution looking for failures of Lambda and alerting you to that. So if you do want to have a, a reliable, uh, reliable data pipeline. This is, a, this is a model that we would suggest and that a number of our customers implement. Uh, basically, what is happening, basically, okay, we are using SQS, simple queuing service. Uh, again, one of the, you could say, legacy services offered by Amazon, but still very much, very much serverless in the sense you are not provisioning any throughput. Uh, don't have to worry about scalability, it's there for you. And the way you use it is uh, that your updates of S3 are triggering SMS. SMS will do two things. SMS will be configured to generate a message in the persistent SQS that there is an update to be processed. And also SMS will invoke Lambda. Uh, now, a subtle but very critical change compared to the previous diagram. The Lambda function here is not processing the request, the SQS message for which, for which it was triggered, but it is checking for everything that is in the queue. So if some previous invocations failed, and if messages started accumulating in SQS, there is somebody who is being kicked on a periodic basis and, and can see that there are those messages and can process them. So that's why I find that this loop here, that the Lambda is actually going to see SQS multiple times, processing as long as there is something, even though triggered just by one specific update. But in this way, you can build, uh, you can build in some reliability into, into the queue or into your data pipeline. Uh, one of my favorite services, Kinesis Streams, moving further. Uh, in a way, Kinesis Streams is a big buffer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's typically used as an input buffer into your application, and uh, uh, it is prepared to process a kind of large amount of incoming streaming data, and then you can have, a, let's say, a lambda function. You can have, let's say, a lambda function processing data that was inserted into your stream. Uh, to give you an idea uh, about the throughput that Kinesis expects, uh, so Kinesis is provisioned by Shark, so it is one of those non-autoscalable services. You have to explicitly say what type of server do we expect. Uh, so it's provisioned by Shards, and uh, one shard provides you one megabyte of data per second in a, or thousand put requests in a. So that's kind of the, the increment in which you are uh, uh, building up your stream. So it's a relatively significant amount of data on this one increment. So we did have customers that says, well, no, we need Kinesis streams because we have lots of data. And then they look at these numbers and realize, yeah, we have lots of data, but we don't have one megabyte per second. But there are applications that do have one megabyte per second. For example, if you have a, a typical example, it would be uh, mobile applications from which you are collecting performance logs. Yeah, so you have possibly millions of uh, mobile applications, each one generating, even if every couple of seconds generates a new message because of the sheer volume, sheer number of those uh, mobile devices, you may end up with very significant amount of incoming data. Uh, another service that can be used is a variant of uh, Kinesis Streams. Uh, this is a fairly new service, and I was very recently called Kinesis Firehose. 
Uh, the main difference between streams and firehose is that firehose is fully auto-scalable. Don't have to worry about provisioning any throughput. Um, and the, but then the way you process data is uh, not directly, you cannot directly feed data to Lambda because the expectation is that the firehose will be really producing megabytes, gigabytes of data per second. So what is happening, the data is being fed into S3, typically to S3 from where you can process it in Lambda. There are alternatives. Uh, you can feed this Kinesis firehose to, let's say, Redshift, what's Amazon Data Warehousing SQL solution, or you can feed the data directly to Elasticsearch, uh, depending on your needs. There is a large number of other, if I would consider serverless services, I'm not going to go through them, uh, through them all. Uh, you saw and demonstrated the list of 50 some services uh, that Amazon provides. A number of them do fall into the category of what you would call serverless and, uh, and kind of would be used in these types of designs. Um, here, just kind of putting it all to the slide. So here you have a mobile app that's built following the principles kind of that we were talking about. So here is my mobile app that's uh, using some sort of a backend API <coughs> through API Gateway, talking to my Amazon uh, uh, AWS Lambda function that implements my core business logic that runs stores data in, uh, in a persistent uh, uh, data store. Uh, actually, here I have the Amazon DynamoDB. We talk the NoSQL database. Uh, an alternative that is on this diagram is using Amazon RDS. RDS stands for Relational Database Service. Uh, similar to Elasticache, RDS is basically managed wrapper on top of MySQL, Postgre, Microsoft SQL, Oracle, Maria, and Aurora databases. So your choice of uh, any of these database engines and then Amazon provides a way on top of it to deal with the failover and high availability within the constraints of what is provided by the underlying engine, of course. Or using Elasticash or S3. And then uh, a couple of services, again, that we haven't talked about. Uh, basically, your API gateway can be passing certain types of requests that are related more to user management and uh, identity management and uh, security and encryption can be passing it in this example into separate Lambda functions to deal with it. that deals with those and uh, that one is using separate uh, services provided by AWS. In particular what's mentioned here is Cognito. Uh, Cognito is basically a uh, user identity management system that can integrate with uh, third-party identity providers for example, through here you could implement signs through Facebook or signs through Google. Again, for those that are going to the tutorial tomorrow, we will be kind of writing some sample code to show how that is done. Or you can use the AWS STS uh, secure token service to generate temporary credentials for, let's say, signing your requests or for controlling access to AWS. Now, uh, I was very much emphasizing uh, the auto scaling and high availability uh, when it comes to serverless. But so it happens that actually lots of these patterns and, and some of these services are actually very nice for light traffic systems and for kind of playing around and, and, and light prototyping. Uh, so to elaborate on it, the uh, vast majority of AWS services do come with a free tier. Uh, basically, they allow you a certain amount of traffic, depending on the service, per month for the first year free. If you are using more than that amount, that amount you will be charged. But if you stay within a fairly generous limits, uh, you do get uh, it is free. Uh, and there are some services, some very interesting services, that actually provide this free tier indefinitely, meaning it doesn't expire after the first year. So for example, Lambda, Dynamo, SQS, SMS, these are all services that do provide 
trade here indefinitely as long as you stay kind of within the within the bounds. Uh, so you can build a small application uh, that's likely used, as I said, being the prototype or being your hobby, and you can literally have it running in Amazon for free. As long as it doesn't have heavy usage, it is up there, it will be working, and it's free. One thing that you will notice is miss here that you would really like to have is S3 for data storage. Uh, you will end up paying for S3, but uh, the pricing model in S3 is such that really if it's a prototype, if it's your hobby application, you are going to be talking pennies a month. It's, it's going to be very inexpensive. These are monthly, monthly quotas? Or, or these are monthly quotas, yeah. These are monthly quotas. Uh, the number of requests, yeah. One million requests uh, or 3.2 million seconds runtime per month. Uh, though, if you are experimenting uh, with AWS, be careful. There are some services that are a little bit costlier, especially if you are playing with it as a private person that started, okay, tens of dollars a month are not that bad. I did end up paying a few hundred dollars a month for turning on a service that I didn't realize was that costly and well, I had to fork on the cash. Uh, so yeah, in particular, Kinesis, uh, in particular, I mean, Kinesis streams is relatively inexpensive, but the Kinesis Firehose, the auto-scaling version of Kinesis, that one starts at around 200 dollars a month. So be, be careful with those. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, I personally believe serverless is here to stay, for better or worse. It's a natural evolution of virtualization. There are some very nice things about it, such as the out-of-the-box scalability and availability. Uh, and its philosophy plays very well with Agile, with DevOps, so those are very nice things. But there are also some challenges related to serverless uh, in particular, it requires significant mind shift in how we design the applications, how we start more and more relying on third-party services. Some may argue vendor lock-in. And there is definitely, so I'm sure you have noticed, some learning curve. There is a number of things that one has to master before being able to efficiently use the serverless design. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, we compare cost of switching from television to serverless with cost of switching from one provider to another. A good example is uh, Facebook, which is discontinued service, so I assume some, some of the clients will switch to another service. Is it comparable? Is it less? Yeah. I would have, I think, hard time kind of commenting on this one. Like Facebook did discontinue the service. Uh, at the same time, Facebook didn't leave their clients completely out and dry. And, and basically, what Facebook offered in this particular case, uh, they offered you to download the engine. So you can download the, if you load an application inside of, uh, uh, inside of this framework. Facebook offered you that, yes, you can download the engine and run it on your own infrastructure. So you can continue running your application, but but you have to maintain the servers. Uh, now, about discontinuing application, maybe going a little bit off tangent from your question, but about discontinuing services, I know that, uh, uh, like for many people, this is a concern. What if suddenly Amazon will start, stop supporting it? And if you look, for example, at Google, uh, Google has a history of you know, offering something and then a few years ago saying, sorry, we are not, no longer supporting it. Uh, though I should say that both Amazon and Microsoft, uh, they have very different, they have very much enterprise mentality thinking. And uh, there is not a single service that Amazon has dropped in their history. Uh, there is one service in particular, SimpleDB, that they are not advertising anymore. But if you have an application using SimpleDB, it is still working. It is still supported. The service still is still there. It hasn't been dropped. It's just kind of not being maintained. So well, we discontinue the wrong example, but let's say 
the results provided with better price. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, I mean, we had this discussion about vendor locking up kind of around the table here. Uh, yeah, there is certain concern that that you are getting locked in into a vendor, in particular with Lambda. Uh, though I tend to argue if, uh, you know, it's like it's using any other software library. If you are really, if it's really important to you that you are not bound to, let's say, Apache MQ as opposed to Amazon SQS. You do spend that time and you write a layer of software that will isolate you from it. And if you need to migrate, you just need to rewrite that version of the code, yeah, that interface that you have. So uh, while you are kind of locked in, at the same time, your application is written in a way that if you have to, you can get out. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is a concern that many people have, and there is kind of no good answer for it. Uh, right now, the competition between uh, basically Microsoft Azure and Amazon is very severe. I mean, if you are guys following it, like they are trying to match each other on like every single piece of functionality, and uh, also on pricing, and one announces a drop in prices the other one for those couple of weeks later. Uh, so at least right now, I wouldn't be too concerned about this, but yeah, it is there. And I said, don't have any good answer for it aside from, yeah, it's like it's any other third party library that you are using. Okay. In your opinion, what will be the best implementation for oh. <clears throat> Try to move some of your application functions using uh, Lambda or and the messaging queues, but still leave the relational database in place. Uh, so the Lambda function will need to write to the relational database. Yeah, I mean, like there is no complication with Lambda function accessing the relational database. I did mention Dynamo is kind of the first choice because that's what uh, lots of people, especially in the Node.js world, are using. But in principle, there is no issue with the with Lambda accessing uh, the relational database. If you are talking about migrating from uh, uh, migrating an existing application into Lambda, I think there is going to be more complications related. Not to the whole application, just just a service specific service that needs to run. A specific service, I mean. Like, it can be, like if, if, if you're migrating a service, I think the main thing to be, to be concerned about there is whether for things to work well in Lambda because of those cold starts, yeah? For things to work well in Lambda, it is important that at least until Amazon improves the implementation, it is important that your service has very short startup time. Yeah, that there is no heavy initialization happening, you know, from the moment you turn on the service and <coughs> it is able to process the first request. Like example was loading jar files. An example would be another example would be if you were to use uh, kind of a big uh, ORM layer. Yeah, if you have your object relational mapping, and at the start of your application, let's say, goes to the database and sucks lots of data and builds some in-memory model. But this would be an example of an anti-pattern for using Lambda, because this is a very costly operation that will very likely result in poor performance. Uh, so I think these are going to be your issues, basically trying to make that service not only stateless, but with quick startup types, yeah, like avoiding global objects, avoiding things that are initialized globally. Uh, I think that's where the main challenge is. And is there a way to make sure this uh, cold start doesn't happen? Like you keep somehow if you have enough? Um, yeah, I, I do have a slide about it that I removed from, uh, from this deck. I was afraid I was going to run out of time. Yes, there is a couple of mechanisms how you can, you cannot guarantee, unfortunately with the current implementation of Lambda, you cannot guarantee, but uh, uh, you can kind of improve your odds significantly. Some of the strategies are 
uh, allocating large lambda functions. Basically, people found out, even though Amazon doesn't, uh, doesn't document it, but people found out that if you allocate your lambda function with more memory, it will stay around for a longer time before the lambda service will clean it up. Uh, and when I say longer time, uh, to give you a feel, we are talking about minutes. Usually, if I call a function and it gets provisioned, and then if I call it within a minute or two, usually it is still there. It is only if I wait like five minutes, ten minutes, then you will find out that your function is not there. But this behavior, you know, it can change if, let's say, uh, there is lots of traffic in that region, lots of other customers are busy because Amazon doesn't publish the algorithm, don't really know what they do, maybe then they would shorten those times. But definitely, larger functions will help you. Another pattern that we recommend to our customers is uh, uh, write lambda functions that are larger in the sense that they have multiple entry points. That your single lambda functions, single, single lambda function basically corresponds to your microservice as opposed to a single API call. Because then you are getting benefits of different API calls keeping that container warm. And so if, if they are happening, you know, if call A happens every, you know, once every five minutes and call B once every two minutes, that call B will keep the container ready for call A. So this, this is kind of another strategy to use. And another strategy is, yeah, like what you said, like creating basically a watchdog type of function and having it called from cron, or actually you can schedule periodic lambda invocations and you can say, yes, every five minutes call this dummy function. And basically the main purpose of the function is to keep your container uh, kind of up and running. But still, this only partly answers the issue because what if you have, let's say, spike in your traffic? Yeah, you would need to start pre-provisioning containers. And so this is what I, what I meant when I said that uh, the, currently these tools are relatively you know, in beta or barely outside of beta. So we're running out of time. Uh, barely outside of beta, but there is, I think, still Amazon has some work to do to kind of deal, especially with these cold starts, a little bit better to really allow Lambda to become mainstream. Thank you very much. I think we are out of time. Thank you very much.